So now I'm going to go into <clears throat> Ancient China Lecture 2, and we're, I'm going to try to incorporate Vietnam and Korea and Japan um, as best as possible into this discussion as well. Um, because when we're talking about Asia, um, you know, another important thing is in context to Korea and Vietnam. Uh, I had a professor when I was taking intro to um, the modern East Asia class at UCSC that was stating that many departments are dominated by people who are experts on China or Japan and Korea and Vietnam often get marginalized um, even though so much is significant to uh, their history there and they're also very much integrated into uh, all of these histories in different ways. Um, I realize that um, for nationalists from the Vietnamese perspective and from the Korean perspective and the Japanese and the Chinese, it can get a little bit complicated for me to articulate it in a way that is not going to see um, seem marginalizing to another or in other words, it's a sensitive topic when you have, um, you, you know, it's like talking about the Irish and the Scottish and the English and the British Isles. Those histories all go together, but there still remains uh, political complications, uh, differences as well as similarities, there's harmonies as well as actual violent conflict. So I just kind of want to point that out. Um, I'm not going to be able to integrate Vietnam, Korea, and Japan in the way that I would like to due to the time factor, but I'm hoping this will at least be helpful to get you, you know, seeing a little bit more of those uh, integrated into this topic. So I'm moving on first, again, continuing with China, and we'll talk about the, the Qin Dynasty, um, the first empire. So we're talking about third cent uh, century BCE. and uh, China's first emperor. Okay, so we're going out of those uh, um, nation states and warring states into a unified um, country. Um, and he's inspired by legalism. I didn't really cover legalism that well in um, the last lecture, but essentially it, it's, it's, it's another Chinese philosophy that you could put somewhat in the same kind of um, frame is Confucianism, which is a, a, a practical type of philosophy to help with the rule of law, for example. Um, so here we have the same, uh, we have a huge army, large surveillance force, standardized written language and laws, and <laughs> he banned the study of philosophy and history. Anytime you think philosophy and history is not important, what you find is people in power always know that the philosophers and the historians are the most dangerous, right? Because we're the ones that complicate the narrative that the people in power sometimes would like to have uh, uh, in their way. All right, so I'm not going to really go too long on that. Uh, here's a nice picture of the Great Wall. Um, so just to kind of go over some interesting... Um, Artifacts. Uh, this is just kind of amazing. I'm not going to go too much into this. I just thought I'd expose you to the terracotta army. If you ever want to get a chance to just explore this on your own, but I mean, um, in ancient China, you definitely find archaeological discoveries and art that is breathtaking. And if you haven't been too exposed to it, I'd like you to. So right now, I'm not going to be able to talk about it a whole lot. But I just want you to at least see this and maybe get your attention um, about some of the many wonders of, of ancient China. Um, okay, so moving into the Han Dynasty, and as you know, we've talked about, uh, I'm just briefly going over the dynasty, uh, uh, different dynasties. The Han Dynasty from 202 BCE to 220 CE. So now we're moving up closer uh, uh, in time, right? Um, and so you basically have civil wars uh, um, that, that it arises out of, and it lasts for over 400 years. We all know that that's a good amount of time for anything, right? Um, so that's a long-lasting dynasty um, of 400 years. And this map shows you the reach that it had. 
okay? Um, so ruling here in the upper parts by Korea. And oh, so here's another thing. Look at Tibet. Look at Korea. Here's Taiwan. Sea of Japan. So you're seeing the closeness. And, and here's Vietnam right here, okay? So you can see here uh, by looking at the geography. And, and just right over here is the Ganges River, um, you know, with India. So um, anyhow, um, you start having uh, a really set system in China of the Imperial University and um, basically written exams that will help uh, a certain type of intellectuals help with the rule uh, in China that are using Confucian thought that we went over in the last section. And so civil service was made up of these educated scholars. They would have really long, brutal exams they had to, to remember quite a bit. And it was very rigid. And that's that's why, as you remember, uh, with Zhuangzi and the Taoists, that they would kind of mock this austerity and this kind of rigidness that uh, was there while the Taoists took a more spontaneous uh, um, aspect of, of living. But you can also see how, I mean, Taoists did have their place sometimes within the state. Um, but you can see how Confucianism would be considered practical for Chinese rulers, right? And why it would be. When, we, when you think about what we went over in the last section. Um, and, and this picture here, these are little cubicles in which men would be taking their tests. Um, this is one of the last, uh, I don't think I'd say it's not the last, but it's an old picture from kind of before the end of all of this falls apart. And you're going to have revolutions in China, such as the Communist Revolution, that is going to get rid of having Confucian uh, civil service, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, scholars in the government after that. Um, what I want to also then talk about is the, the Silk Road. Um, and so I'm going to let I'm going to play this clip right here. And I want you to think about also trade and the connections of China and some of the other civilizations that we've talked about, talking about how Buddhism is eventually going to get into China and different types of trade. Um, the Silk Road is a very famous route, which did connect parts of this far east with um, the larger world. So here I'm going to play this, this clip right now. It's a short one, and then I'll end the video here. My book, Shadow of the Silk Road, is the account of what I think is the most ambitious and complex and difficult journey that I've taken in 40 years of traveling. It took over 7,000 miles and eight months, starting in eastern China, traveling into Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, which were those, those republics that fell off the bottom of the Soviet Union in 1991, then south into Afghanistan and Iran finally to Turkey. I was following what is surpassingly the greatest and most influential trade route in human history, the Silk Road, um, which went uh, for a quarter the length of the equator uh, across the whole breadth of Asia, carrying goods for at least 2,000 years, partly from China to Europe, um, partly from Europe the other way, and all the countries in between um, from a time earlier even than that of ancient Rome. But my journey was not primarily historical, it was more a physical journey to an area of extraordinary richness and, and some danger. I went by camel, by, not often, more by local bus, Land Rover occasionally, um, vans, hitchhiking, um, whatever, really whatever transport I could find. You might wonder in what frame of mind somebody undertakes such a journey. And I can only say that in my case, I risk things that I would never normally risk if I was simply on holiday. You do things for the book. It's almost as if there are two of you going. There's the one who's traveling and there's the one who's sitting on his shoulder and who is going to write about it. As far as I know, this is the first contemporary account of somebody traveling the whole length of the Silk Road from east to west. 
I would not expect anybody, anybody to be following my footsteps, um, even if they wished. It's politically so complicated, as well as occasionally dangerous. But I hope that people would see this extraordinary world a little through my eyes and enjoy it or otherwise my experiences. I'm hoping that this book will convey something of the strangeness, the mystery and the romance of the lands through which I traveled, which is not just historical, but it is relevant today. There are countries, of course, which have recently have been so much in our consciousness, not just China, but Central Asia and the Islamic lands, Iran, Afghanistan, countries to which I've tried to put a human face. Well, he's definitely confident. Uh, in any case, uh, I'm going to end this lecture here. We'll move on to the next one.